The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 37th chapter, the book of Ezekiel. A familiar story, but as is with so many familiar stories, it bears revisiting and hearing once more. Ezekiel chapter 37, we'll be reading verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. And I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, on this day, God, when we celebrate the arrival of your Spirit, the birth of your church, we pray especially for your church your church around the world. As like the prophet, we are called to prophesy, God, to speak hope to dry bones, to speak words of love and hope in the midst of chaos, tragedy, and uncertainty. We lift up your church around the world and your church here at home. And God, now as we have gathered together as a small part of your church, We pray your Holy Spirit come again and speak to us as we listen for words from Holy Scripture, words that your Spirit uses to speak to us even now. Be with us, we pray, in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. In his ancient Greek epic, Works and Days, The poet Hesiod tells of the creation of the first woman. I think it may be a more interesting story, maybe even than Genesis. It goes something like this. She was formed from the earth by the gods on Mount Olympus for one very specific purpose. The first woman, according to Greek mythology, was created as a punishment for men. (laughs) Joe, I saw that hand. Nobody else saw it, but (laughs) Sharon may not be here, but she's going to know you raised that hand. Think about that for a minute. The ancient Greeks believed that women, so just let that sink in. Don't take that away from the sermon. Don't go and tell people. The preacher said women were a punishment for men. Don't take that. That's what the ancient Greeks believed. 
But in this story, in this story about the creation of the first woman, she was given these gifts from all the gods on Mount Olympus. The goddess of war, Athena, uh, clothed her in a sparkling silvery gown. Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty, gave her grace and desire. Hermes gave her deceitful, a deceitful disposition and the power of speech. And it was Hermes who gave her a name. And that name was Pandora. And Pandora means all gifted, since she had been gifted by all the gods on Mount Olympus. So when Pandora, this created woman, was sent down to be the bride of Epimetheus, Zeus gave her a final gift. It was a jar, or a box, you probably heard. And so as she had this jar and this box, curiosity overtook her, and she opened it. And out from this jar, out from this box, sprang all manner of cruel spirits. This woman was not the punishment for men, but the gift that Zeus had given her. For out of that jar came plagues and demons and cruel spirits, all manner of evil went out into the world. And Pandora, as they were leaving her jar, leaving her box, she slammed the lid shut and saved one spirit. In the Greek, it's elpis. In English, it's hope. She left hope in the box. Hope was all that was left. It remained as the singular comfort that was being birthed into the world through this first woman, into this evil-plagued world. Hope remained, yet while it may have been kept quietly in Pandora's box, I can't help but notice that we don't have a box to carry hope around in. I can't help but notice how elusive hope can be for the rest of us, how hard it can be to find hope when we need it. In those times when you're sitting in the doctor's office, you think everything's fine, and he walks through the door, serious face, says, I need you to sit down, I have something to tell you. And he uses words like malignant, aggressive, and doesn't talk about years, he talks about months. How do you find hope? And that. When you hear rumors about layoffs, you start counting the number of days you've been there, the number of years you've been there. You start hearing about pink slips. You start thinking about having to stand in that unemployment line and you say, I've been here for, for 15 years. I don't know what to do. This is all I've ever done. Where do you find hope in that? When the arguing seems constant, when the distance grows, when there's separation, pretty soon you got to sign those papers that say, never again will you be with this person. This is all I've ever known. It's all there ever is. Where do you find hope after that? When you hear the jets fly over, when the bombs start to blast, when war comes to your neighborhood, when you get on a raft and float across an ocean, just to stay alive. Where do you find hope in all of that? Of course, hope doesn't always just seem to be absent in the wake of tragedy. I mean, think about it. You get everything you've ever wanted. You get the promotion. You win the award. You graduate at the top of your class. You get all the scholarships. You win the game. You make it to a comfortable retirement. And before long... Before long, the shine comes off the apple. The new wears off. And that desire for more, more meaning, more purpose, more life takes hold. But you look around and nobody wants you. Nobody needs you. There's nothing left for you to do. No higher rung on the ladder. How do you find hope in that? When the battle's over, the destruction, the bondage, the exile, and death, after all that settling in to a rut takes place, how do you find hope? Where do you get it? Where's Pandora's box when you need it? Of course, we find, we find the prophet Ezekiel faced with the same kinds of questions in the midst of his story, the one that we stopped for a moment to read a part of this morning. 
It's perhaps the most well-known part of Ezekiel's story. He has a vision. God takes him out, shows him this vast valley or a plain to show him something. And in this case, God shows Ezekiel a valley filled with bones. Not the freshly gnarled bones from the dinner table. Dry, bleached by the sun, human bones. And Ezekiel, we're told, is led all around them, back and forth, over the pile of bones, as if he's supposed to inspect them, to pick each one up, make sure there's not a little bit of meat or tendon hanging on them, right? To make sure there's nothing stirring in the middle of that pile. And then God asks him, Mortal, can these bones live? Now what kind of question is that? It'd be like if we went to lunch at Jefferson's and ate a whole pile of wings, and I looked at them bones, hey, you think them chickens will cluck? Or you sat down at Cooter Brown's, ate two slabs, you think that pig will ever oink again? No. Can these bones live? But if you consider the one who's asking the question, maybe it's not so crazy to think. But it does seem outside the realm of possibility, doesn't it? Like, like it wouldn't really make sense for bones to live again. I mean, resuscitation is one thing. We see that all throughout the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, people who were dead being brought back to life, sort of resuscitated. We see it in the New Testament. But bones? And Ezekiel goes a step further. Very dry bones. Bones disconnected and spread all out through a valley. It's one thing to know that these bones left to dry and dissolve in the desert can live. It's one thing to know that God is God and has brought life from the dust at least once before. But to really believe it, to really believe that bones can live, to really believe that the expiration date is not passed on the body's ability to be resuscitated, I, I don't know. I think it's over. So I can understand why Ezekiel Wise prophet that he was, though he does some crazy stuff, just read the book, you'll see. I can understand why Ezekiel responds to God's question the way he did. Did you notice it? Mortal, can these bones live? What's Ezekiel say? Oh, Lord, you know. It's as if Ezekiel doesn't want to fess up to his own doubt, right? As if he doesn't want to be honest with God. Mortal, can these bones live? No, they can't live. They're bones. But instead he says, oh, uh, God, you know. He doesn't want to live up to his own doubts, his own certainties about the metaphysical universe and the laws that govern it. So one can, you you can almost hear him, can't you, shrug his shoulders. Well, I don't want to tell God what I really think. Oh, Lord, you know. We do that too, don't we? God asks us, do you think this can happen? Do you think this is possible? How can this happen? And we look at ourselves, we look at the world around us, at the knowledge we have, the resources we possess, and with a mumble we say, well, God, uh, you know, you know. We don't want our doubts to show. We don't want our our doubts that, that what seems impossible just might be that impossible We don't want our certainties about the ways of the world, the the ways of our comfort, to be subject to the mystery and uncertainty of God. And so we just sort of put it off on God, right? Well, you know, I suppose, Lord, bones could live, but why don't you show me? You do it. You've never prayed like that, have you? Well, God, if you want this to happen, give me a sign. And you sit there and wait. A cloudless day. Lord, if you want me to do something, make a lightning bolt strike right here. No? Well, I guess you don't want me to do it. We put it on God to, prove God to prove God's self to us, to show us whether or not the impossible really is impossible. That way our anxiety can stay at a minimum. And if God should prove to do the impossible, well, then we've got a story to tell. And if God doesn't prove it, well, then God must not want something from us. But that's not the way God seems to operate, especially when it comes to those of us called to prophesy. I mean, did you notice? Did you notice that? After God asks Ezekiel if these bones can live, after Ezekiel says, oh Lord God, you know, God doesn't, doesn't crack his knuckles and roll up his sleeve and say, all right, prophet, stand back and watch this. 
Did you notice that? That's not how the story goes. God doesn't snap his fingers. God doesn't speak to the valley of dry bones. What does God do? There's no divine utterances in the book of Genesis. God doesn't say, let there be life in them bones. No. They don't spring back to life like those dancing skeletons on the old cartoons. There's none of that. God doesn't command the bones, in fact, to do anything. Did you notice? God never speaks to them. Instead, he commands the prophet to prophesy. God doesn't speak to the bones. He speaks to Ezekiel. Prophesy to these bones, he says, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you. I will cause flesh to come upon you, cover you with skin, put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. And Ezekiel says, I did what I was told. And then there was this strange sound of bones shaking coming up from the ground, coming together. The word says a rattling, and the bones come together, bone to its bone, sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. God doesn't speak to the bones. He speaks to Ezekiel to do it. It appears that dry bones can live again as they come together and now lie on the floor, not, not as scattered bones, but now as cluttered corpses. But something isn't quite right. Something's still missing. So God tells the prophet again, not the bodies, the prophet. Prophesy to the wind, to the spirit, to the breath, to enter these corpses. And after the prophet does it, breath comes into the bodies. And they arise and stand on their feet as this great multitude, an army. What was once dead, decomposed, and dry now stands alive and breathing on its feet. A pile of bones, bleached by the sun, once hopeless, now inhales and exhales the breath of a great multitude. This isn't the reviving of a once sick child. This isn't the resuscitation of a recently departed brother. This is the impossible made possible. One could even say this vision is more than Lazarus come walking out of the tomb wrapped in grave clothes. It's hope. That where there once was death, long-standing death, there's now hope. There's now life. And though it's only a vision, a vision explained to the prophet of what God will do for these exiled people of Israel, it's a powerful vision of what God can do. But don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that Ezekiel's vision is a point-for-point -point testimony of God's ability to slap muscles and tendons and skin on an old skeleton and make it a living, breathing person again. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this, and it's old, worn out, and cliche. We say it so much, I wonder sometimes if we even know what we're saying. But this is what it says. Nothing is impossible with God. Now, that's nothing new. You may even have that stitched on a pillow on your couch at home. I don't know. That's nothing new, but what might startle us, what might strike fear just a little bit into the deepest parts of our being, what will test those simple one-liners of our faith is this. Yeah, nothing's impossible with God. But God doesn't have to prove that to us. God doesn't have to prove to us that God can do the impossible. But our faith, our faith means proving to ourselves that we actually believe what it is we say we believe about God doing the impossible. It's one thing to say nothing is impossible with God, but then to look out on the valley of dry bones and believe they can live again. To live among exiled people as the prophet and believe that one day they'll be freed. To witness a divided nation and trust it can come back together and be made whole. That's what faith is. To sit in an upper room and wait for something to happen after the resurrected Lord has ascended to the Father. To stare into the empty cupboard and hear your child's growling stomach and know they will not go hungry. That's what faith is. To see someone you disagree with as a friend to behold a sinner as a saint, to look in the mirror and actually believe that God loves you. That's another thing altogether, isn't it? That's when hope becomes palpable. 
when it's fleshed out and filled with the breath of the Holy Spirit, when it's more than words. Because it's easy to say we believe nothing is impossible with God, or God so loved the world, or I can do all things through Christ, or God does not show any partiality, or Jesus loves me, this I know. We can say all of that, but to prove it, to prove it to ourselves, That requires bold action. It requires selfless trust. And above all else, it requires we do something besides shrugging our shoulders and looking up and saying, Oh, Lord God, you know. It's why God tells the prophet to prophesy and doesn't speak to the bones. It's why when we pray to God, God, would you help us? Would you fix this? God doesn't snap God's fingers. He looks at us and says, Here! I've given you hands and feet and the power to do something about it. That's what Pentecost is all about. It's why the Holy Spirit comes. Not so we just all sit around and stare at one another and go, I think I got it figured out and here's the do's and don'ts. Because the Spirit comes and dwells in us and dwells among us and gives us the power to do something about the words we say we believe. That's what it's about. If we really believe all the things we say we believe about God, about Jesus, about salvation, about life, about the church, about love, if we really believe those things, we ought to prove it. And let me tell you something. Saying it over and over and louder and louder doesn't do a thing. To say we trust God, that we have hope, And then we cross our fingers, we hedge our bets, we store away our five-gallon buckets of potato soup getting ready for World War III. That's not trust. To say our works don't save us, that our deeds and our clean living won't earn God's love, and then try to find every single way we are better than someone else. That's not faith. That's not hope. To say we believe that nothing can separate us from the love of God, that God loves everybody, and then walk away from somebody who's seeking that love for themselves. That's not love. That's not God. Like Ezekiel, you and I are commanded to prove our faith to ourselves. God doesn't need to prove anything to us. And God doesn't need proof from us. But we need to prove it to ourselves to others so that they might have that same faith. Like Ezekiel, we aren't called just to believe that dry bones can live again. We're called to take part, to take part in the power that revives them. God didn't just ask the prophet, do you believe they can? And then make it happen? He said, if you believe it, then tell him. Prophesy to it. Do something about it. So I ask you today, as we've gathered around the Lord's table, as we will in just a moment, on this Pentecost Sunday, as we proclaim together our belief in the love of Jesus, as we remember the power of God to breathe life back into dry bones and to raise up a crucified Christ, as we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birth of Christ's church, as we gather in this place and collectively claim our faith in God, Do you really believe all that you say you believe? If you do, then do something. Prove it. Today. For God calls us to do more than just believe. God calls us to take part. To take part in the inbreaking of his kingdom. Would you pray with me? Holy God, as we come now to your table, Lord, as we come now to be served and to be reminded of your great love for us, empower us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit to know that belief, belief, God, in what we say we believe is so much more than just a recognition of what's right and wrong that it is a call to action. It's a call, Lord, to prophesy to dry bones when we say we believe they'll live again. 
It's a call, Lord, to love our neighbor as ourself when we say we believe those words from Scripture. It's a call, Lord, to trust in you when it's more than just lip service to religion. So, Lord, remind us of that as we take from this table. As we eat the bread, as we drink from the cup, remind us, God, that our faith is one with hands and feet, with flesh and blood, and the breath of your Holy Spirit. So come with us now. Speak to us, Lord, as you invite us to the table. Help us, God, before we take from it to lay aside whatever it is that may distract us from you, from our neighbor, from the love you call us to share. Help us, Lord, to lay it at your feet that we may take this supper in a worthy manner. Be with us now, Lord, as we come to the table. In Christ's name, amen.